you could turn to Matthew 25. That's what we're going to read today. It's one of the heavier teachings slash parables. Uh, some debate on whether or not it's a parable, but we'll leave that up to other people. We're not going to talk as much about that. Um, if you see me hobbling around up here and you're concerned, I think I tore my calf, so that might limit me. I might not move around as much today, uh, or I'll walk around and regret it. We'll see what happens, but uh, we got we got plenty to talk about this morning. Open to Matthew 25. I really, <laughs> this is a tough message because there's a lot here in Jesus's kind of final teachings before he's uh, arrested, um, has a mock trial, just a gross miscarriage of justice amongst the Hebrews and the Romans, and then he's murdered uh, for your sin, for my sin, for the world, because of God's great love for us. And, and this final teaching kind of culminates a lot. We have, to, we have to talk about some things before we get to Matthew 25. But we're going to start um, just, uh, Jesus is in Jerusalem. And if you've been following along with the Bible recap, we've been doing this uh, Bible reading thing. If you're new here, we've been reading through the whole Bible this year. And Drinking from the fire hose of Jesus over like two and a half weeks, it's a lot. There's a lot he has to say. And we're going to get to three points at the end of the message, uh, sort of. I don't know how timing works with my message, but we'll get to the, uh, at some point, there'll be about three points of things I just want to talk about that stand out to me this time reading through all the teachings of Jesus at once. But at this moment, he's in Jerusalem. He's arrived. And just... I, it's so important for us to imagine the context. We're going to talk about that here in a minute. But the, these are all the disciples following him, men and women, uh, outsiders that have become insiders because of the Messiah, uh, sinners, uh, potentially some religious people. They're all following Jesus. And if he's in Jerusalem, what's in their mind? They're thinking, oh, he's going to do that thing. He's the king. He's going to usurp and he's going to take over and David and the city of this is all going to happen. That's what's in their mind. And they're excited. And then Jesus keeps teaching these things about death and about waiting and about virgins who aren't prepared and about um, uh, people squandering their talents or, or the, the things God's given them to uh, instead of using it to him. The, he has these messages that are kind of not what they're expecting. Uh, and then we get to what he says in Matthew 25, the sheep and the goats, as it's called, which I, I would argue are some of the hardest teachings of Jesus, minus some of the things in the Sermon on the Mount as well. Before we read them, we need to have a quick conversation about context. Hey, already there. Context, context, context. If you notice there's a difference in each of those, um, that's intentional. I think this is a helpful way to think about reading the Bible, and a lot of times uh, there's a really great book written by a, a scholar named How Not to Read the Bible. Uh, I think it should be required reading for in the Bible because our culture has so belittled what it means to believe, what it means to study, what it means to think about history. Gosh, I could talk about this for a long time, such a tangent, but we just have this idea in our scientific method, Western minds, that proof works the same in all categories. And we have this idea that, well, because we don't have this many documents about the historical Jesus, it must not exist. We have hardly any documents about historical Caesar. We have very few documents about Abraham Lincoln, but you believe in all that. So, I mean, we, we have to wrestle with what does actually it mean? to believe something. What does proof actually look like? That's a tangent for some other time in scholarship. Ask me about it. We can wrestle with it. But in context, we need to think about how we should not read the Bible. One of the ways we should not read the Bible is open it and say, okay, Psalms 87, three glorious things of you are spoken, O city of God. City of God. I know a city. Jefferson City is a city. Okay, Jefferson City must be a city of God. Glorious things are spoken. God's going to make Jefferson City glorious. Poof. That was improv. He said, just anywhere. We can do this anywhere in the Bible. Just open it and start reading somewhere and say, oh, I get it. See, that's not the thing. God gave us a book, not a passage. He gave us his word. This is why we've been teaching all year. The Bible's one unified story that points to King Jesus. It's a unified story. So whenever you're reading anything in the Bible, you first want to look at the little context. Like, where is it in that story, right? We can look at Matthew 25 and we can say, I know what sheep are. I know what goats are. I know what the word judgment means. I understand eternal punishment. We can import those sort of things because we know those words. But we also have to understand, hold on, what is big C context? What is it in the overall story of Jesus in general? Why is him being in Jerusalem? Why does that matter? Why is this his last teaching? Why does that matter? And, and 
Is this amongst parables? Is it parabolic? Is it something in between? Because we have a limitation of language and knowledge. And so maybe he's speaking parable and not parable at the same time because Jesus can speak layered like that in ways we don't fully understand. And so we have to ask these questions of the broader context so we don't import. One of the worst things you can do with a parable is decide, I'm going to take this parable and form my entire doctrine about X off of this parable. That's not even what parables were for in Hebrew literature, right? That's not why parables are given. If you're forming your entire doctrine after one thing Jesus said or after one thing without looking at the entire context, it's possible that you could be off. You could miss something because God gave us his word, right? A collection of things for us to understand. And we're going to see that as we go through. We're going to read some things together. Some of you are looking at me like this is a no-brainer or also I've blown your mind. I'm sorry if I've ruined how you've read the Bible. It's important. This is why we're reading all of it. This is why when you see us teach, we have so many scriptures and the tech team's sick of me sending them 15 slides every Sunday of so many verses because it's an entire book. And I want to guard you from just saying, Oh, okay, I got to go do this. And we're about to read something that's going to blow your mind if you take it out of context. If you decide to say, okay, everything is about this thing, you could miss it because Jesus had a lot of other things to say as well, right? Then you've got big context. This is the entire Bible. This is the entire story. How does this fit into the entire narrative of scripture, the redemptive history? You've seen the, that image we've showed before of all the different links and how the Bible has over 65,000 times its self-references and self-connects. How does it fit into the entire context? Are you good? You understand context stuff? Shake your head. Man, I feel like I've bored you already. That's okay. We'll get there. So before we read Matthew 25, I want to read some other teachings of Jesus, things that we need to make sure we have in our minds. So not so we lessen the blow of this teaching so that we can frame how we're thinking about it, because otherwise we could take it too far. We could make it some social justice initiative that ultimately comes all about you and what you do and still completely miss Jesus. John 3.16, we read this last week, for God so loved the world that he gave. He's a giver. He's generous. We have a scarcity mentality. It's all about me. We want to hoard, protect. I want to do. Find anything in your life. I promise you can say, as a mother, you say, these are the things that if anyone questions, I'm not a good mother. And so I'll protect them and I'll guard them. And this one thing my kid does send me through the roof. Why? Why does it make you so angry? Because you're scared that it's going to rupture your identity. Why are you so worried about not having enough money in your bank account? Why are you so worried about getting this next promotion? Because you're scared. It's a scarcity mentality. But God's posture is generous. He's a giver. He's an abundant giver. He so loved the world that he gave that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Jesus is a gift from the Father who loves us. Our faith in him gives us eternal life. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I read this together. I am the way, truth, life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. Keep that in mind as we're reading other teachings of Jesus. Jesus still puts it back on him. He's the gift from the Father's love. Whoever believes in him, that's what saves you and has eternal life. You believe in him. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Matthew 22, 36 through 40, uh, a teacher comes, uh, a, a scribe, one who knows the law, and they're all arguing about the law. We've talked about this several times, so I'll, I'll save you the context teaching, but comes and asks Jesus, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Trying to trap him, also trying to kind of get like, hey, what, what, what do I got to do? What's the perfect thing, right? You kind of also hear in this like, what must I do to receive eternal life? Like we talked about last week, but anyway, he says, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus says, you shall love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commands depend all the law and the prophets. You know that whole Old Testament stuff, that stuff that you're studying and reading, that stuff that you're trying to become a Talmudim, a disciple of, of Hebrew literature. You're memorizing Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. You're trying to memorize the prophets. You know all that? Just know this. This hangs all of it. <laughs> Think about what if I just said, hey, you know, the only important part about American history is this. And I say one sentence. Some of you who might have lived different parts of American history might say, listen, millennial Dave. Don't ever call me Dave. But listen, Millennial Dave, maybe you need to think about history differently. That's the tension. Jesus just summed up all this stuff they've studied and said, love God with everything. Every part of your being, every fiber of existence you can imagine, your heart, soul, mind, strength, and also love your neighbor. It's actually one command. The way he, uh, the Greek works, he's not saying two separate things. Once you do this, check, now go do this. He's saying you can't do this without this. You can't do one without this. You can't be loving the Lord with everything if you're not loving others. You can't love others if you're not loving the Lord. They go together. 
John 13, Jesus is talking to his disciples in a similar vein about love. He says, a new command I give you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. John 15, 9 through 13. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. We're going to talk about the word abide a lot next year as we go through John. John loves that word. Abide in my love. If you keep my commands, you will abide in my love. What's the greatest command? Ah, yeah, you you catch it? If you keep my commands, you're abiding in my love. Do you want to love me? You've got to keep my commands. How do you love me? You keep my commands. What are my commandments? To love me and to love others. Whoa. Abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and abide in His love. These things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than someone who lays down his life for his friends. We must abide in Jesus' love. We abide in his love and we keep his commands. His command is to love God, to love others. So, begs the question, what is love? Church, what is love? Right? Someone knows. We teach this a lot here. Love is? Commitment and sacrifice. Thank you. I know y'all know this because I sit around you and you tell me all the time. Like some of you make posters and send to me over this. You know that this love is commitment and sacrifice. I'll never stop teaching that because it's so important in a culture that tries to mystify in love or to try to, to adulterate it. And actually, even in adulterations, it works because the things you love, you do give your commitment and sacrifice to. That's how you measure. When a wife says, I just feel like you don't love me. She's not saying, I'm not feeling that feeling that I've never felt before. It's mystical. It's meaningless. Blah, 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 love, love, love. She's saying, there's no more commitment and sacrifice. There's no more action. There's nothing you're doing that shows me that you can back up this vague love that you're supposed to have for me, right? You guys get this because we write songs about it. We we write poetry about it. Love is shown and seen through commitment and sacrifice. Tell me someone who loves you that doesn't have great commitment and sacrifice. Tell me someone who doesn't love you that you would list the things amongst what they're not doing being in the realm of commitment and sacrifice. Love is commitment and sacrifice. If we are to abide in his love, we will be so committed to him that we'll make the sacrifice of following him with everything. And we know that's true because he is love. And because of his great commitment for us, because of his great love for us, he sacrificed for us. This is how we understand love. We see Jesus offering himself up for others, and we show love through that. With this framework, understanding that Jesus says the greatest thing is to love God and love others, that salvation comes through Jesus alone, through faith in him alone. More on that later. With that framework, now let's read Matthew 25. We're going to slowly go through it. You ready? Say, I'm ready. Here it comes. Matthew 25, starting in verse 31. I was once told four years ago, I don't give you guys time to turn to your Bibles, so I'm just going to, I'm going to wait. feels like an eternity to me, probably only four seconds. Six, seven, eight's enough. Here we go. Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man comes. Who's the Son of Man? Yeah, it's like we had a whole sermon on this twice, actually, in the last five years. The Son of Man is Jesus. It's his favorite name for himself because of Daniel. It's a prophecy of the Son of Man being enthroned with the Father. It's a way to get at this Trinity thing that's not a word that's in the Bible, but it's a concept through the Bible. Trinity is a really hard thing to define and discuss without stepping on toes and someone kind of firing up because it's something that defies our understanding. It's, we have limited knowledge, we have limited uh, language, and so whatever language we say about Trinity we might miss, but we do understand that God is in a equal, perfect, unified relationship with himself as the Father, Son, and the Spirit, and they're separate, but they're also interconnected in ways we can't fully get, and that doesn't reduce their power, their responsibility, or their roles in active existence. How's that for Trinity in a, a small, yeah, so like, yeah, okay, good enough. Thank you. Just say good enough. Good enough. Okay. So where was I? He, the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him. That's an important phrase because the, all the angels are coming with them. He's separate from the angels. Hebrews cares a lot about them understanding this. Jesus is not just another angel as some uh, faith traditions would try to tell you, uh, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness. Jesus is utterly significant and special. He's the son of man. He comes with the angels because he commands them. They follow him. He's king. He's the one who has glory. The angels come with him. He will sit on his glorious throne. What do we have here? 
Jesus is coming back. We've had these parables of you got to wait, you got to wait. What are we waiting for? What do we do with these talents? You tell us to not be the wicked servant who just buries them, right? Uh, what are we, how are we not the virgins who are foolish and not having enough oil for our lamps? Keep me burning, burning, burning. Like, how do we, what do we do? Now you get it. He's going to tell you what you're supposed to do. When he comes before him, he will gather all the nations. Say all the nations. All. Who's included in all the nations? everybody right it's all everybody he's saying everybody no matter what you think if you think you're outside no you're not there's inclusion happening here already because the the jews listening to this are saying oh he's going to grab all the nations and he's about to he's about to tell us he's about to tell us how bad them gentiles are and maybe them samaritans too he's going to tell us how bad all these bad people are they're excited that's not where he goes jesus has a very different line for the people who are in and out here we go all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. This is the only phrase that makes people think this is a parable. This is why scholars argue. This doesn't really sound like a parable. It sounds more like prophecy. It sounds more like this is how it's going to take place. Now, even in prophecy, you have parabolic language. You have apocalyptic language because we, we're not fully grasping what's happening here. Like, I can't tell you exactly what this scene looks like aside from what these words are because it's intentionally vague. Because we have faith. We trust that God is above us. And also we have a limitation. So, uh, you want my money? I don't think this is a parable. I think there's something literal that's happening here. But I think there's a deeper point to be focused on. So we're going to skip that, right? Bible nerd stuff. Jump over it. It's going to separate like the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his... And the goats on his left. Right? I got confused of your view versus my view. Either way. So, he will place the sheep on his right, the goats on his left. He's going to gather everyone. And he's going to separate them. There's going to be a judgment. Whether or not you see this as a parable, there's a major point here that there will be a judgment. The king is returning, and he will return in glory. In, you just read the Old Testament, some of you. Who has glory? Who? God. He is glory. Right? The Shekinah glory. And what is glory? Kabod. It means weight. Oh, God's heavy, right? All right. God has it all. He's the heaviness. He's the ultimate glory, the kabod. But when the Son of Man comes and He sits in glory, ah, there's another, another theological claim being made here, right? He's just, it's not like He's sneaking in. He's just saying, as a matter of fact, you know who's going to be here? I'm coming back. King Jesus is coming back, and I'm going to have glory because I and the Father are one, right? More, more stuff there. We don't have time to unpack all that. Here's the point. There will be a judgment at the end. Jesus wants you to know that there's going to be a judgment. And we're going to talk about that here in a minute, but I want to talk about what, what will be judged, right? Because Jesus has already given us a clue of those things, and Paul kind of unpacks it a little bit as well. I'm going to just shotgun these. You can take a picture if you want, but you need to know, we've said this before, we are so convinced that we aren't going to be judged, that we're not going to, we're not going to be condemned if you believe in Jesus. Everybody's getting judged. All through Scripture, God judges based off of what you do, your works. It's all through Scripture. No one escapes that. Here's some verses. You're going to be judged by your works. Jesus said this, Matthew 16, 27, For the Son of Man is going to come with His angels in the glory of His Father, and then He will repay each person according to what He has works. You're going to be judged by your words. Jesus says in Matthew 12, 36, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For those of us who like to talk a lot and who say a ton of words, like me, that verse should give us incredible pause. How many careless things have you said to the people you love, to other people listening? How, how many times have you slightly inflated something so that you stand above? Because your scarcity mentality makes you feel so thin that you need to rise above. And so you have to say some careless things. Well, I've done this. Well, I, let me tell you about, this is what I do. Here's how I make granola cake or whatever it is. Like, oh, I do this with granola cake. Who makes that? But these things lift us up. You're going to be judged by your works, by your words. Romans 2 tells us we'll be judged by our thoughts. And on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. That actually reminds us back, Paul's linking to, uh, come on, David, 2 Kings 19, where he says that God sees the secret things, not just all the altars and idols they've built, but he sees the secret things that they're not even telling anyone. God knows what you're doing. And you're, you're sitting there like, yeah, I've heard it all before. Do good stuff, think good thoughts, hear no evil, speak no evil, think no evil. But we're going to be judged for that. 
And we don't like that. We don't like that. Don't judge me, man. You can't tell me how my... You can if you're the objective source of good. Nothing is good if there's not a source. If it's all up to you and it's all relative, uh, love is love. You do you. Whatever you think is best. It's okay to live life how you think, but I'll live life. If there's no standard, then nothing's actually good. It's all just stuff. It's meaningless. But you have convictions. You have passions for things you think you, that are good. Why do you think they're good? Because there is a father who created you to bear his image. And he's written his image. He's breathed his breath into you. And you have some understanding of what's good. Even if you're completely adulterating it because of your scarcity of mentality, because of your rebellion, you have some standard of good. And the Bible's telling you that only God is good. He knows what's good, and he's going to judge based off what that is good. There will be a judgment in the end, and Jesus wants you to know it. Verse 34, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father. The word is daute. Say daute. It sounds a lot like duty, which is a word that Jim Dixon laughs at every time we have it come up in a meeting. But uh, daute, duty, right? It's, a, it's a, the Greek word for Come. Can you think of other times Jesus said, come in scripture? Come and see. That's one. I've got three written down. Come unto me, all you who are weary, heavy laden, saying come, right? That's the second time he used it. You know the first time Jesus says come? Come and I will make you fish. What am I doing up here? If I can't walk around, I do weird things. I'll make you fishers of men. Daiute, come. And then now, those are all in Matthew, by the way. Now Matthew's using this word, come, those who are blessed by my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. This is Eden language. You remember when I created good things and you just messed it all up? I've made it better. I've made it right. And you get to inherit it. I fixed all that has gone wrong. You get to inherit it. Why? Verse 35. Now we get a clue as to why these people get to come. Daute, why do they come? For I was hungry, and you, listen up, this is easy to skip by, read these words. I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous, hold on, stop. These people are now called righteous. They're not just sheep. They're not the whole nations. They're not just blessed folk. They're righteous. Righteous is a relational word. Say relational. We think about righteous as being a word from the 60s and 70s for cool, right? Or maybe in the early skateboard culture, righteous, righteous, right? Or we think of righteous being about a list of checks, right? To be righteous, gosh, I wish we had time for this. We're just going to do it. Uh, to be righteous is to be right within the roles and relationships that you're supposed to have. It's to be right. It is right for Lee to treat Gary a certain way because the way he treats him that is good would be right within the roles of his relationship as a grandfather to Gary. It would be weird for Lee to pick and hold me up during service and bounce me while he's singing and then take me outside to do whatever he's doing with Gary outside. That would be weird because that wouldn't be a righteous relationship between Lee and I because I'm not his grandson. And so righteousness has a framework of right standing, right relationship. And we've messed it all up. Sin has corrupted what it means to be a husband, to be a father, to be a spouse, to be an employee, to be a guitar player, to be bald, whatever your role is in life. Sorry, those of you who are bald, you get picked on. Whatever your role in life, sin has messed it up. And these people are called righteous. Righteous. Why? Why do they, they have a right relationship? When Jesus says there's a judgment and he's going to separate, you know what separates people? Relationship. Having a right relationship with others and having a right relationship with God. Why? Because they served, they sacrificed, they gave of themselves. They're called righteous because they have a right relationship with the Lord. Because they have a right relationship, the Lord want them to have with other people. Doesn't this sound like loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself? It's almost like Jesus meant it when he said, this is the greatest commandment. <laughs> These people didn't realize they were doing this. They're like, when did we see you? Oh, I haven't read that yet, sorry. Uh, then the righteous will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? So it's a good question. Or thirsty and give you drink. When did we see you a stranger and welcome you? Or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick and in prison and visit you? And the king, the king, the king will answer. Truly I say to you, as you did to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did to me. 
What allows them to come? His invitation. And what, what was that? What did they do? We just read it. You list it. What, what's something they did? They gave. What did they give? Clothes. They gave clothes. Food. Time. They gave. It's so interesting that we didn't even plan to talk about generosity again this week, and it just so perfectly ties with last week, because when you read Jesus, you can't get past the fact that when we have faith in Jesus, it transforms us in the market way that it transforms. One of the ways you can look at someone and say, I know they're a Christian. Jesus said, they'll know you're a Christian by your love. And what is love? And sacrifice, commitment and sacrifice. And so then they'll know you're a Christian by how you're committed to others, by how you're sacrificing for them, by how you feed those who are hungry, by how you give drink to those who are thirsty, by how you clothe those who are naked. And Jesus says, the king, the one full of God's glory, he says, when you've done it to them, you've done it to me. You have a special connection with King Jesus, the, the son of man, the glorified Jesus. You have a special connection with him in a right relationship because of the way you treat these who are, who are broken. Who are the least of these? Some argue that this is only talking about Christians. Christian brothers and sisters, that's it. That's all this could be talking about. In context, I see that argument. I studied it way more than you want to know. I could talk to you about it until you're blue in the face. And I can list all the scholars who think that. And, and listen, here's the reason why I can only take a half step there. is because it says... My brothers, or some of your translators say, my brothers and sisters. Here's why I can't step there at all. Just consider this. Who did Jesus consistently welcome and love in his ministry? Sinners, like Zacchaeus, right? Who else? Prostitutes? You can say that's in the Bible, right? Yeah, all sorts of broken people. Did he, did he welcome outsiders like, like Gentiles? Did he welcome centurions? Religious leaders who are, who are fake, he still welcomed them in and bid them to follow him. Jesus is having this posture through his entire life. And so when we try to shove this context in this parable of, oh, no, no, just because of that phrase, brothers and sisters, he's just talking to Christians, it robs it from the entire context of how Jesus lived his life. And Jesus bid us to love as he loved. And then he says, what does that look like? He doesn't have to say the word love here because it's exactly what love is. Clearly, we're loving other people when we do this. And the, so the least of these must be those whom we love in Christ. And we show hospitality, generosity. Hospitality uh, in the Greek, it's a word that means to welcome outsiders, to make outsiders feel like insiders. The reason we have a hospitality team, right? It's not just a coffee team because that doesn't mean anything scripturally. We have a hospitality team because we want to make anyone who's an outsider feel welcome as an insider. And one of the ways we can do that is through coffee. But maybe your passion is to make outsiders feel like insiders and feel welcome. Join the hospitality team. We're praying about how we constantly make people feel welcome because Jesus says, come. Come and follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. Come, all who are heavy laden and weary, and I will give you rest. Come, those who have followed and obeyed me to love other people. You get to inherit the kingdom. Because when I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was naked, you gave me clothes. When I was in prison, you visited me. When I was sick, you took care of me. This is not the only thing Jesus cares about, because clearly later on he says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all things I've commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always, even until the end. When you look at the aggregate of what Jesus is teaching in Matthew 25, you can tell that what Jesus is trying to tell us is that to connect with Jesus, to have faith in Jesus, to be ones who follow and obey him, are ones who live generously who live hospitably, who sacrifice for others, because that's how you love the Lord, by how you love other people. That's how you make disciples, as we see in the early church in Acts. Adam's going to talk about that next week. Jesus wants us to know that there will be a judgment, and it will come, and those who are welcomed into his eternal kingdom have connected with the person of Jesus by their actions towards others, specifically how they love and sacrifice their time, money, and resources by giving generously in the name of Jesus. Verse 41. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed. What was the original thing in the Bible that was cursed? The ground. It didn't. Why? The ground was going to be hard to produce, right? And link, scripture link, sorry. So you hear the word curse, you think, whoa, the ground's cursed, right? Right? And so that Jesus ends up with a crown of thorns, which the ground produced thorns. It's like he was literally taking on our curse. Anyway, and so then also, right, Jesus cursed the what? The fig tree? 
and it wasn't going to bear fruit because it wasn't bearing fruit, right? Jesus has this care of being fruitful. What does it mean to be fruitful? What does it mean to curse it? What does it mean? We are supposed to be fruitful and multiply. You start seeing this theme. What does it look like? Well, it must look like caring for other people, loving other people, sacrificing, not living in a scarcity hoarding mentality, but giving of myself to other people. Please don't tune out and just say, I get it. Christians are supposed to be nice and benevolent, and I'm supposed to serve and wash people's feet and all this. That's fine. Are you doing it? Because you will be judged. You will be judged. You will be judged. When you stand before Jesus, your works, your thoughts, your actions, your, your, the way you talk, it's going to be judged. And Jesus is holding you to say, hey, when you've treated people in this way, when you've loved them, when you've sacrificed, when you've lived generously. This is why we teach so often about sacrificial giving. Because if you don't have the posture to give, you're going to naturally hoard. If you don't take the discipline to give to the church, you're going to hoard your money. I was calculating recently how much money we would save if Nikki and I didn't give to the church. And I started thinking of things I could have immediately bought in the last two weeks because I'm a really selfish, dark person. But as I was doing it, I was imagining, why? Why do we give to the church in light of what we were talking about last week? Because his kingdom is coming. His will is done. And if Nikki and I don't have postures to live generously, we'll naturally be selfish and buy things that we don't really need. I don't need to upgrade my 12-inch dual bevel uh, radio or sliding uh, chop saw. I don't need the new $400 one that's on sale at Lowe's. I don't need that because I've got one. But I'll certainly buy one if I'm not giving to the church. Why? Because I want David's kingdom to come. I want David's will to be done. This is why Jesus cares so much about this. Because your natural heart posture is scarcity. I could tell you you're selfish all day long, but let's even take a step back. You're selfish because you're scared, because you want things to be about you. We want things to be about us. We could be this way as a church, too. We could argue, and we could get all tense about where our money's going and how it should be better for this ministry or that ministry. Thank God we have a financial council that meets for two and a half hours uh, several times a year to wrestle with what our budget looks like and to pray and say, God, what are we doing with this money that comes in? Thank God that we have a church full of givers, people who give to understand we need a sacrificial posture because our natural posture is not that way. It's a discipline. Just like the scales being ripped off. It's not the thing that you want. It's not the thing most comfortable because it's not natural to you. This is why Jesus says it's a new teaching. Love. Love other people. Because it's not natural for us. It's not natural for us to live open-handedly. Because the more open-handedly we are, the more we get the short end of the stick. The more we get crucified. This is why Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. No longer I live, but Christ lives in me. Are you willing to see your life open-handedly to give of your time, your money, your resources, and your stuff? Because Jesus says you'll be judged by such things. And I think this should give us pause. Continuing on. Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire. Say eternal fire. We like to avoid these things in Scripture, so we're just going to lean into them. Eternal fire prepared for who? Say it like you mean it. Who? Who? The devil and his angels. The devil's the father of lies, deceiver from the beginning, pulling us away from what God wants. So God has a just punishment for that cat, right? I'm not literally believing he's a cat. Sorry if that got weird, the Egyptian for you, whatever. But he'd say, God's got a punishment for the, for the devil and his demons. He said, hey, I've got this fire prepared for them. That's what this is. Maybe it's parabolic. I, I don't tend to think so, the way scripture talks about it. There is a literal eternal punishment for them. And you know who else goes with the devil and the angels? Those who've been deceivers from the beginning, those who've been liars? These cursed people. Why are these cursed goat people going? Verse 42, for I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. I was naked and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they will answer him saying, what? Lord. They acknowledge he's the Lord. They know he's the Lord. Jesus said elsewhere, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Prophesy? Wait, you mean people can prophesy in Jesus' name and not know Jesus? Yes! Get that out of your head that just because they say Jesus Christ, they must be speaking in Christ. That's not what Jesus says. Many false prophets claim to be Jesus. They claim to be speaking in Jesus' name, right? Don't misunderstand what Paul said. Jesus clearly says, many will say to me, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not do many signs and wonders in your name? And then Jesus says, I never knew you. Away from me, those who practice lawlessness or curse it. I never knew you. And hear the same thing. Lord, when did we see you hungry? This is their excuse. We, if we would have known you were hungry, if I, if I just, God, just tell me your will. 
If you would just tell me to give up all this money, God, write me a letter. Just tell me, hey, please give $222 a month to the church. Like, just tell me, hey, just quit your job and go do this, this, this. You know that thing you really want to do to love these people? I'm just going to write you. You just like, God, if you would just tell me, make it obvious. Lord, did we not see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? When did this happen? Let us know. Then he will answer them saying, truly I say to you, as you did not do to one of the least of these, you did not do to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment. But the righteous, those who are right and have a right relationship, will go into eternal life. These will go away into eternal punishment. There is a judgment. It has eternal ramifications. And it tends to bear on, in this story of Jesus' teaching, it tends to bear on how you treat other people, how you love them, how you have a relationship with them. Isn't it interesting that when Jesus is asked, what is the most important thing of all this Bible stuff? What's the most important? He says, it's relational. To love the Lord with everything and to love others. That's what it is. And now here in this parable, the final judgment comes down to righteousness, relationship. Are you living in a right relationship towards God and towards others? There's eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And these people will go away into eternal punishment. We talked so long on Friday as shepherds about hell. And uh, if we preach enough on it, not too much on it, whatever. And it's tough because you have some faith traditions that would say, oh, I just really like the fire and brimstone teaching. And it gets tricky because you have some scholars who argue, you know, there's actually a whole lot more in scripture about eternal life and spending life with Jesus than there is about specifically what we say is hell. And then you have people argue about the historicity, the historicity of hell and say, like, man, if you look at Christian history, the way they viewed hell, the first 200 years of Christian history looks very different than the way they did in the medieval ages, looks very different than the way that we view it now and everything in between because there's just been growing idea. And we have this idea like right now, if I say, what does Satan and demons and hell look like? You would probably import some idea you have about, about hell from a cartoon or pitchfork and horns and all these things. I'm not here to tell you exactly how this all pans out. Here's what I know scripture says for sure. There will be eternal separation. There are things like weeping and gnashing of teeth and fire. It's compared to Sodom and Gomorrah, who doesn't exist. No one knows it's lost all of its honor. And so whether you're on one side or the other about what, what hell is, and here's what you do need to know. There is a hell. There is eternal punishment. And all of us are eternally bound. All the people you love, all the people you don't love, they're all eternally bound. And Jesus here says, when I come in glory, I'm going to separate, I'm going to judge based off of works, based off of how they treated other people in a right relationship. There are three points that I want to make, and then we want to just land on the gospel as we close. Um, these three points are just our shepherding takes. Um, Adam's not over there, but if he was, he'd be looking at me right now. We'll settle for Donald. Um, but uh, settle for Donald. What are, that's, I didn't mean that was rude as thing. I'm, I'm blessed with Donald. Gosh, I just got distracted. Come on back. There are three things that I started texting some people. If you've been following the Bible recap, or if you haven't, then just imagine, we have drank from the fire hose of Jesus' teachings for what, was it been two and a half weeks now? It's been pretty short, about 14 days, maybe 10 days. It's just been nonstop. It's not even quite just narrative. It's just like tons of red letters of Jesus saying stuff. And it's so much to take in. But sometimes it's great to read scripture that way because you start seeing a big context of like, man, but Jesus keeps saying these things. Here's three points that I want us to remember about things that I've been hearing Jesus speak as we, we read these things. Jesus wants people to know that there are those who think they are in, are good and right, but in reality, they're actually out, bad and wrong. And I'm so sorry, church, those watching at home, Sometimes I feel like just pastor insecurity, and that's just my role is to make you have a big, healthy fear and insecurity. But I feel like that's what Jesus taught over and over and over. He wanted people to know, you think this, but actually it's this way. All these people think they're in, but actually they didn't prepare well. They haven't waited well. They're the ones who actually killed the, the, the landowner's son or whatever. These All these parables and teachings of people, they're not on the inside. They're actually out. They think they're in, and that's the tragedy. And I hope that that's that fear and insecurity in a healthy way comes over those of you who don't know Jesus or those of you who are just banking on grandma's faith or who have this veneer of being a Midwest good old boy, good old girl, because that doesn't save you. Jesus would say, you're out. 
I never knew you. Depart from me, those who practice lawlessness. Jesus would say that to some of us who think that we've been doing all this churchy stuff. I used to go to promise keepers. I used to sing in the church choir. I used to... Saving faith looks like people who put their faith so much in Christ that it transforms them to live a life of generosity, hospitality, exactly how Jesus lived. That's the final point, but we got it right now. Jesus wants you to know, are you missing it? There is an eternal destination for everyone. There is an eternal destination. It's a lie from evil that this is all there is, that this paycheck, that this job, that being 18, being 19, this girlfriend, this dating relationship, this tool, this new house, that's it. Just focus on that. We're all eternally bound. And if evil can get us just thinking about now and what's immediately around us or just this life, ding, ding, you're done. That's it. Jesus wants you to know there's eternal ramifications. Church, do we see people as eternally bound and care for that trajectory in their lives? Are we okay just with the casual church attendance, people who come to events every now and then? Are we actually measuring people by the way Jesus measures them? Visiting those who are estranged and broken, welcoming them in, providing food for those who are hungry, loving other people sacrificially through generosity and hospitality. Number two, Following Jesus fundamentally changes us in a way that certainly is seen through generosity, hospitality, and sacrificial living, which is love. This is love, commitment, and sacrifice. We talked about this last week. Hey, throw up that generosity slide from last week. Maybe you need to take a picture of this. It's red because it's from last week. You can't tell it's red because of the projector, but that's okay. Um, Point for myself. You can't tell. Uh, So we put this up last week. We're just talking about in general, when you have an abundance mentality, there's a father who's in charge of everything. You don't need to live scared. You don't need to hoard for yourself. You can say, hey, I'm going to give of my time, of my money, and myself. I'm not going to go through this list for you. We're just going to leave it up here for a little bit. You can take a picture of it. Here's some things we've landed on, on what it means to, to share with others, to table with others, to give other people of your time, your energy. If you follow Jesus, Jesus cares that those things are going to lead to acts of generosity and hospitality, welcoming others. What is hospitality? It's making outsiders feel like insiders. That's what it means when someone has a hospitable home. You ever been in someone's home where it's like, you know, maybe your first thought isn't, this is the cleanest house I've ever seen, which used to baffle me when we'd have to like scrub. I I love my mom, man. I don't want to say anything against her, but she would help clean the toilet. And she'd say, man, what if someone came over and saw that our toilets were messy? And I was like, whose house do I go to that I ever noticed that their bathroom's messy and think, man, I don't like these people. I'm sorry, mom. I love you. But like, like, I just didn't think about that's not hospitable to me. Maybe it is to you. And maybe my gift is off with hospitality. But when you go to a hospital home, you notice that they're so giving like what? Here's this. Let me provide this. No, no, I'll, I'll do the dishes. Or you have someone's like, hey, let me do the dishes. I love when we get together with, with uh, the Mosses and the Lorings and the, the, the Stoltz of this like, tribe that gets together and we vacation together. One of the cool things that happens is we don't, we plan, we have a meal plan, but we don't plan who's cooking, who's cleaning, who's making sure the kids eat first, who's going to pray. It just happens because we're believers in Christ who naturally live hospitably through generosity. And so all of a sudden Heidi's just doing the dishes. And no one's questioning whether or not they're good enough because just Heidi chose to live generously in that moment. No one's questioning why, you know, uh, Kevin's making, you know, fart noises to the kids. So they're all laughing. Like he's choosing to be generous and spend time with the kids, right? Uh, That's that's how it happens. When we follow Jesus, we'll live generously. Point three, Jesus cares about our hearts. What inwardly drives us, what makes us tick. Is it a scarcity mentality or an abundance mentality? Is it faith or fear? Is it a self orbit or a Jesus orbit? All these things we talk about here. Who's truly Lord of your life? He wants love to be the motivating factor and focus behind everything we do. Jesus is our why. He's why we should be doing everything, because of his love. He's the objective source. This is why Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, the love of Christ compels, it controls us. We believe that one man died, and because he died, everyone may live. We all died through him. That's what he's saying. He's saying the love of Christ, it compels, it controls us. This is why salvation is through Jesus alone, by faith alone. Maybe you hear this and you think, man, I'm, I'm not living sacrificially enough. Your answer is to look to Jesus. Maybe you're thinking, I'm not sure if I'll be counted amongst the sheep and the righteous. The answer is to look to Jesus. Maybe you're thinking, man, I'm full of fear and doubt and conviction of these things I shouldn't do, the, the internet history that I hide, or, or the drinking, or the, 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 the pills that I keep popping, or the way that I treat my kids, or the way that I yell, my spouse and I are constantly arguing, we don't want to tell anyone at the church, we don't want them to think less of us. Got all this heaviness on you. 
Your answer is to look to Jesus. Because the scripture tells us that only Jesus can change our hearts. As we close, there are three scriptures that I want to read to help marry these ideas. Because it's easy to read this parable and say, I didn't give food to that person on the street last week. And so therefore, I'm probably going to the eternal punishment. And that's exactly not what Jesus wants you to hear. Because Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You will be judged by your works. But the only good works you're going to be able to do is through Jesus. Romans 3, 21 through 26. Write these down. Take a picture of them. This is what it means to be saved. By now the righteousness of God, God functioning in the right relationship as God as he should, has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation and atonement by His blood to be received by? Faith. What saves you? Faith. Faith saves you. Because of his gift of grace, because of Jesus, Jesus saves you. He draws you. He saves you by your faith. That's your response. You say, yes, daddy. You believe in him. You trust in him. Maybe you've never done that. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier. We have to have justice There has to be a separation. God took on the punishment for himself, our atonement, to make us right. And those who don't believe, they have to be separated. Otherwise, he's not good. Otherwise, he's not just. It's just a fairy tale. This is reality. He is just and the justifier. As the one who has faith in Jesus, righteousness and redeemed are only through the gift of grace, through faith. Jesus became hungry, thirsty, a strange, naked, sick in prison so that we could be righteous and redeemed. James 2, 14 through 18. Some of you were hoping I would go here. We got to go here. I wish we had more time to talk about it. So the brother of Jesus, he says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, gosh, he has, he has to have Jesus' parable in his mind. He's his brother. He heard these things, right? Sorry. Uh, If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Here's the tension, right? Oh, I'm saved by faith. By faith. You're saved by faith in Jesus that fundamentally transforms you because the same power that rose Christ from the dead comes to live in you and transforms you so that you could live the way he created you to live. That's what you're saved by. This tension between faith and works is not so you go out and do, 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 do. It's that you live like Jesus only through him. Ephesians 2 helps us. I feel like I read this every week. Sorry. Take a picture of it. It's worth it. Ephesians 2. But God being rich in mercy... Because of his great love with which he loved us, even though we are dead in our trespasses, we are made alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. For by grace, verse 8, for grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is a gift from God. For God so loved the world that he gave. This is a gift from God, not a result of works so that you would boast. We are His workmanship, created in Christ for good works. You see the tension? Paul gets it. Paul's not pushing James away. They're together. They're saying, hey, you want to know what it means to follow Jesus? It means that you're going to be so fundamentally changed that you're going to have these works come out of you. This is why Jesus can judge in these ways. Jesus gets it. He's teaching you right from the start. How can you be a Christian if you're not loving others? Because the greatest commandment is to love God and love others. Who do you hate? Who do you refuse to serve? Who do you lean on some political system to say, oh, well, it's, it's not really my problem. Or maybe the, the government or the whatever should take care of it. Orphans are a church problem. Foster care is a church problem. Homelessness is a church problem. AIDS is a church problem. These things are on us. All the people in the hospital are sick. This is a church problem. And we just decide, I'm going to wait for the next vote. I'm going to wait for the next president. Stop it. Jesus says you're going to be judged by this, guys. Who do you know 
that is thirsty, who is hungry? Who do you know that is not welcomed? Jesus says that those are the people that you connect with him by serving. Faith in Jesus saves you. We are saved. Salvation comes through faith in Christ alone. And that faith transforms us into living like Christ through his spirit in us. Loving others in Christ through our sacrifice, generosity, and hospitality. Salvation comes through faith alone in Christ. And that faith transforms us into living like Christ through his spirit in us. Loving others in Christ through our sacrifice, our generosity, and hospitality. This is your calling. I could say all the same things we said last week. Where are you choosing to not be generous? Why aren't you giving to the church? What's holding you back? It's, it's actually one of the only things God challenges us in scripture. Say, hey, test me on this. Give. I will bless you, right? Like, why aren't you giving to the church? Do you not believe that this is his kingdom, that this is his body? He's literally put his spirit in us and he moves and lives to us. If you don't believe that and so you're not giving, then why are you here? Why don't you help us recognize how we're missing it? And I bet part of the reason we're missing it is because you're not giving. Like, this is why we are so provisional on asking, hey, we need people to serve in childcare. We need people to help with the Operation Christmas Child. Sarah's got days that aren't filled. Why are we doing that? Because the love of Christ compels us. It controls us. Because we know there are people who are hungry, who are thirsty, who are naked, who are estranged. And when we connect with them, we connect with Jesus. To have faith in Jesus is to live hospitably. May we as a church, may you as an individual, may you as a family take time now during this response to pray and say, God, how do we live generously? Don't start with, let me tell you, God, I've been doing all these things. I've been, stop. Don't be that person. Open your hands. Say, say, God, you speak to me. How do I need to be more generous? How do I need to be more hospitable? How do I need to be sacrificing on my time, my money, my stuffs, my things? Because this is what it means to follow Jesus, to love him, to love others. If you could bow your head and close your eyes, we feel led this morning to make a clear pathway if you don't know Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, if you've never given your life to him, it's made very clear in scripture that you are saved through faith. If you feel full of fear and doubt and, and you're afraid, and you're the man, I don't know if I'm going to be amongst the righteous. I don't know if I'm going to be a goat, if I'm going to be an eternal. Are you talking about eternity? Maybe I'm going to hell. I don't know. If you don't know, it's called conviction. Maybe the Spirit's moving in you. Maybe the Spirit's telling you, hey, you, you haven't given your life to Christ. You're still holding on. You're duplicitous. You're trying to do it yourself. And so with, with everyone bowing their heads and closing their eyes, with the, the distance we have on, online as you're watching this, I want you to have this moment to simply say, we're going to be silent here in a few minutes, and we're just going to let music play. I want you to have time to say, Jesus, I want to have faith in you. I believe. Help my unbelief. I'm coming to you. I'm opening my hands. I cannot save myself. I can't do it on my own. I can do nothing. I need to abide in you. I need your sacrifice, Jesus. Only you can forgive me of my sins. Only you can make me right in a relationship with you, right in a relationship with others. Every broken part of my life can only be resolved through you because Jesus is everything. Father, you are everything. I give my life to you. Maybe that's you. And that's your prayer this morning. If you're taking time to pray that this morning, I would encourage you to come talk to me. Come talk to one of us up front. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Profession is a part of faith because faith has action. Faith without works is dead. If you believe in Jesus, tell somebody. Maybe you don't need to come forward and tell me. Tell someone right afterwards. God's putting someone in your mind right now that you need to tell. God's putting someone online that you need to message. Say, I just gave my life to Jesus. What do I do now? What does this mean? I want to follow Jesus. Maybe your response right now is to join the church. Maybe you're, you're saying, man, I, I, just, I, need to, I need to commit to being a part of this. I need to commit to the generosity, the hospitality, the sacrifice of this local body because God's called me to live in communion with other people. He's called a people. Not a person, a people. He's called all of us together as one body. Maybe that's your response right now. Church, everyone else, if, if whatever God's moving, I would encourage you in this time as we're silent, just for a couple minutes before we start singing, open your hands. Ask the Lord, how can I be 
generous, hospitable? How is my faith producing in me the sacrificial living that you've called me to, to love you and love others? Ask the Lord that this moment. Maybe you need to grab your spouse and pray with them. Whatever the Lord's doing, whatever the Spirit's moving, you take time. We're going to be silent for a minute, and then I'll pray, and we can worship together. This is your time to respond.